Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the Dirichlet distribution. Now, lucky for us, this is one of those topics in data science where it sounds complicated and the math might even look complicated, but it's actually just an extension of something we probably already know and understand. And that's going to make it a lot easier to understand for us. So let's set the scene as we always do with the real example. Let's say that you just started a small university. So there's you you're looking cool because you just started your small university. Now, because you just started, you're only offering two majors. You can either major in math, which is we're just going to denote this by the square root sign, or you can major in science denoted by this test tube. Now, you only have a couple of students so far. So there's five students who are enrolled in the math major, and there's 10 students who are enrolled in the science major. Now, the thing you're trying to model here is, well, what's the probability? I want to model the probability that a student would be a math major. Now, thinking about all the component parts we have, we have two categories. We're trying to model the probability of one of the categories, which implicitly will model the probability of the other because they have to add up to one. Sounds like a perfect candidate for the beta distribution. Now, I have a whole video on the beta distribution. I'll link it below, so feel free to go and watch that, but I'll recap it briefly here as well. The beta distribution is trying to do exactly that, and the inputs to the beta distribution are generally speaking, the number of successes plus one as the alpha term, and the number of failures plus one as the beta term. Now that terminology, successes and failures, is kind of general here. It's not really successes and failures, but it's the number of people who are majoring in math plus one gives us that six as the alpha parameter in the beta distribution. And the failures, quote unquote here, are the folks who are majoring in science plus one, who's going to give us that beta parameter here. So as a recap, our beta distribution is fully parameterized by an alpha parameter and a beta parameter. And how we get them is using these real data points we have here and adding one to each of them, and that gives us the beta 611 distribution. Now, if I draw a picture of the beta 611 distribution, it looks like this. Of course, because it's a beta distribution, it is on the range of 0 to 1. We don't have any positive probability less than zero or greater than one because the beta distribution is a distribution which is used itself to model a probability. In this case, the probability that someone would be a math major. And we get this distribution. here, And so that gives us a full distribution for modeling the probability that someone is going to be a math major. So that's mostly recap there. And now here comes the extension. Now let's say your university grows a little bit and you're able to offer a new major. You hired some extra professors, you have the resources in place. So you say, we are going to introduce an English major denoted by this pencil here. And let's say in the first class where you offer this, you have five students who are majoring in math, just like before. You have 10 students who are majoring in science, just like before. And now you have 15 students who are majoring in English. How do we model the probability of each of these? The probability that someone would be a math major, the probability someone would be a science major, and the probability someone would be an English major. Well, we can't use the beta distribution because that was fully parameterized by just this alpha and beta parameter. There's no other parameters available to us in the beta distribution. And so to model this probability of math, science, and English, we're going to need to introduce a third parameter, which is going to be the number of students who are English majors plus one. So this set of parameters is pretty much like this set of parameters. It's just we've added an extra parameter to account for the English majors. And we're going to need a multivariate extension of the beta distribution, which, surprise, surprise, is called the Dirichlet distribution. The Dirichlet distribution, very, very simply put, is going to be the beta distribution, but allowing for more than two categories. The beta distribution was just used to model probabilities of two categories. The Dirichlet distribution is going to be modeling the probabilities of three or more categories. And as you might expect, another way to say that is that the beta distribution is just a special case of the Dirichlet distribution. If we were to remove this third category, the probability density function would revert right back to the beta distribution. So the Dirichlet distribution is just an extension. And so one other important point to note as we're talking about the beta or Dirichlet distributions, I think a confusing point with either of them is that they are probability density functions of probabilities themselves. And so just like in the beta distribution where our range on the x-axis was a probability, and so a draw from the beta distribution is going to be some number between 0 and 1 that represents 
a draw of the probability of success. Just like that, a draw from a Dirichlet distribution is going to be a vector of k probabilities, which need to add up to 1, because they're going to be modeling the probability that we would be in class A or class B or class C, in this case math or science or English, or if we introduce more majors in the future. And so a draw, when you take a draw from this Dirichlet distribution, it's going to give you a vector or a list of probabilities, one for each class that you're dealing with, and those need to add up to one. So here's two possible draws from our Dirichlet distribution. One could be the probability someone's a math major is 20%, probability someone's a science major is 30%, probability someone's an English major is 50%. Of course, these three numbers add up to one. Here's a different draw from that same Dirichlet distribution. So we got 0 0.8, 0 0.1, and 0 0.1. And the first draw, given the data that we actually have, is more likely than the second draw. And that's what we're gonna get to next. How do we actually construct the probability density function from scratch, from the ground up? So you, you know on this channel we like to build up formulas instead of starting from the formula and trying to break it down. And so the question is, if I was trying to devise the formula for a Dirichlet distribution from scratch, now that I know what the goal of that distribution is, how would I devise that formula? So that formula is going to be capturing the probability that our vector of probabilities are equal to some certain values, p1, p2, p3, again, such that these probabilities have to add up to one, given the data that I actually see in the world is alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, which is again, the number of students who are enrolled in the math major plus one, number of students enrolled in science major plus one, number of students enrolled in the English major plus one. Well, let's start thinking about it. First, some shorthand, we're gonna say, let alpha is equal to the sum of all of these alphas. That'll be a useful uh, variable to have on hand going forward. So if I have this data on the right-hand side of this conditional bar, and I wanna know how likely are these probabilities, given that I have this data, well, this kind of just reduces to a probability problem that we can work through. How many things, how many observations do I have total? Well. I have alpha one minus one observations from the first class, alpha two minus one observations from the second class, and alpha three minus one observations from the third class. So in total, if I take those three numbers I just had and add them up, then I have the sum of the alphas, but I have to subtract one each time I visit one of the alphas, and in total there's k of these alphas. So I have a total of alpha minus k data points here. Now, I know that alpha one minus one of them belong to the first class. And so what we're gonna start with in our formula is gonna be, take the total number of things I have, and this notation, if you're unfamiliar with it, is the choose notation from combinatorics. Basically what it means is that, given I have alpha minus k things, how many ways are there to choose alpha one minus one of them? And what I'm doing here is choosing the ones of the total things that I have who belong to the first class, who belong to the math major in our case. Now that I've chosen the ones that belong to the math major, I want to apply this probability that I'm trying to model, the first one, the probability that someone would be a math major, for each of these alpha one minus one people. So P1 for the first person, times P2 for the second person, times so on and so on and so on, times P1 for the alpha one minus first person. And basically here we're assuming they're all independent, and so to get alpha one minus one total people majoring in math is enough to just multiply or raise p1 to the power of alpha one minus one. And so if we understand what's going on in this first term, then we're gonna understand the rest of the formula very, very easily. And so let me just recap, hopefully, uh, to set that in stone. This first term is basically just telling us, I know that I have alpha one minus one people majoring in math, how many ways are there to do that? How many ways can I count to do that from the total number of people I have in my sample? And now I'm going to enforce that this probability applies to each one of those alpha one minus one people. And that's going on right here. So this is giving me the total probability across all the different ways that could happen of having alpha one minus one people major in math if the probability I'm trying to model is P1. And so the rest of these terms are literally just doing the same thing, but now for the people majoring in science, the people majoring in English, if we have more majors, people majoring in history, and so on and so on. So I wish I had a better layout on my page, but this term here 
is paired with this term down here. So this is just accounting for the people who are majoring in science. And then this term over here is paired with this term down here. This is accounting for the people who are majoring in English. This looks extremely complicated, but as with a lot of things in combinatorics, things actually cancel out quite nicely so that all these combinatorial terms here, all these choose terms, actually collapse into this fraction that we have here where we have alpha minus k factorial, which is the total number of observations that we have, divided by the product of a bunch of factorials, one for each of the different majors that we have, one for each of the different categories that we have. And inside each of these factorials, the argument is the total number of people majoring in math, the total number of people majoring in science, total number of people majoring in English, so on and so on and so on. And then we collect all of these terms, all of the p something to the power of something, all of these terms, and that's what we get collected right here. This is a product notation, if you haven't seen it before, very analogous to the sigma notation for sums, except here this is telling you to take the product over things. And so that is constructing this probability density function from the ground up. That is basically how the probability density function for the Dirichlet distribution looks. With one important note, this numerator is not actually alpha minus k factorial in the actual probability density function. It is actually alpha minus one factorial. And so I wanna make this very clear because when I was writing this sheet, I wanted to balance between building this up intuitively, but also making sure that you actually know the correct formula. And so I'm gonna cross this out because this is not actually the correct form. The only minor adjustment we need to make is that instead of alpha minus k here, this should be a one, alpha minus one factorial. Now you also know on this channel, I don't like to just randomly change formulas without giving you some indication as to why we did that. Uh, even if they are minor things like this. And so I am actually going to walk you through why we do that. And it really comes down to just the fact that this is a probability uh, density function, a PDF, and integrating over all of these P1, P2, P3s that add up to one, we need to get one. Every probability density function is only a probability density function if integrating all of its arguments gives us a total probability of one. That actually is not true for the initial form that we conceived, and let me give you a little toy example to explain why. Uh, our toy example today is actually k is just equal to two classes, so we don't even really need the Dirichlet distribution, we can use the beta distribution, but it's easy for us to reason through this and that same logic will apply to three, four, five, and more classes. Let's say that alpha one is equal to two, so the total number of math majors is one, and then therefore alpha one is one plus one and alpha two is equal to one. So the total number of science majors in this toy example are zero. And so zero plus one gives us our alpha two. Alpha is the sum of our alpha one and alpha two. So alpha is equal to three. Now let's see what the probability density function for modeling P1 would have been if we didn't do that small adjustment that I just did. So if I didn't do that small adjustment that I just did, I would do alpha minus K factorial so three minus two factorial gives us one factorial divided by alpha one minus one factorial and alpha two minus one factorial. So one factorial divided by one factorial, zero factorial is just going to be one times that probability P technically to the power of alpha one minus one, but that's just a power of one. And so the probability here is very, very simply modeled by just P. Now what happens if I integrate this probability density function over the entire range of possibilities between zero and one? Well, this is actually a very simple integral to work out and we get that the integral comes out to one half. Uh-oh, integrals of probability density functions need to come out to one. So this is not a probability density function. Let's see what happens instead if we use the version, the real version, where we do alpha minus one factorial in the numerator there. So that means alpha minus one factorial is three minus one factorial, which is two factorial. So the probability density function is adjusted by a factor of two. And as you might expect, integrating over that probability density function indicates a one, which means that that actually is a probability density function. Anyway, I went through all that just to hopefully somewhat justify why, even though all of our intuition was correct in building up this formula, we need to make a minor adjustment to the numerator here basically so that this whole thing integrates to one. There are more theoretical reasons why this is true, but hopefully this is a good balance between me just saying this is true magically 
and having to explain it fully, fully, which would take a really long time. So this is the full form of the probability density function of a Dirichlet distribution, and this is the logic we use to build that up. So now to close this video out, I just want to note some statistical properties of the Dirichlet distribution and why those statistical properties line up really well with all of the intuition we've been building up around what these alpha parameters mean in the Dirichlet distribution. Um, I won't be proving each of these statistical properties. Uh, you could totally do that. Fun exercise requires taking some pretty um, interesting integrals, but we'll take them for granted today. So the expected value of each of these probabilities under the Dirichlet distribution, so the expected value of the probability that you would study math or science or English, is equal to the appropriate alpha parameter divided by the sum of all of the alphas. And as we know, alpha i is equal to the total number of people studying math, for example, plus one. And alpha is the sum of all of the alphas, which means it's the total number of people we have in our sample, plus k. The reason is that we add a plus one for each of our k classes, so we end up getting a plus k. Now let's say that n goes to infinity, so we get bigger and bigger and bigger samples. It's years or decades in the future. Our university become very successful. There's thousands of students enrolled at the university. So this plus one and this plus k are going to be negligible. So this whole thing converges to n sub i over n, which is simply just the empirical number of people studying math divided by the total number of people at the university, which is the empirical, the observed probability at our university of someone studying uh, math or science or English or history, however many majors we have. So the reason this is nice is because the expected value of one of our probabilities in the Dirichlet distribution is going to approach the empirical probability the analogous empirical probability as our sample size gets bigger and bigger. And that's that's uh, maybe this is a good place to bring up that we knew that the beta distribution was used a lot in Bayesian statistics to model a probability in the absence of data or with very limited data. The Dirichlet distribution is literally trying to do the same thing. It's just that we're trying to model a vector of probabilities over more than two classes. And so when we have a very small number of people at our university, like just five people in one major, 10 people in another major, 15 people in a different major, then the Dirichlet distribution helps us balance the lack of that data while still using that data to adjust a completely flat distribution where we assume that there's equal chance that people would study any major. But as we get more and more and more data, we have the same property as we did in the beta distribution where the Dirichlet distribution's averages are allowed to converge to the empirical averages we see in our now very large data set. And that's why this convergence is a very nice and required property. The mode of the Dirichlet distribution p sub i for any of these probabilities is going to be alpha i minus one divided by alpha minus k, which is going to be equal to n sub i, because remember we know that alpha i is equal to n sub i plus one. If you rearrange that, move the plus one to the other side, then you're gonna get that alpha i minus one is equal to n sub i, and divided by n, well, same, same logic for the denominator here. So the cool thing with the mode is that it's not even a convergence thing. No matter how many data points you have, the mode of a Dirichlet distribution's probability vector is always going to be the empirical data that you have. It's always going to be n sub i divided by n. And finally, we'll look at the variance. This also has very nice convergence properties, just like the mean. So the variance of p sub i for any of these p sub i is going to be alpha i over alpha times 1 minus alpha i over alpha, all divided by alpha plus 1. Now we do the same game where we just replace the alphas with the actual counts. So alpha i is equal to n sub i plus 1, alpha is equal to n plus k, same trick we did up here, 1 minus that fraction, all divided by n plus k plus 1. Now let's do the same trick. Let's let n approach infinity. We get more and more and more data, more and more and more students at our university. A lot of these constant terms are going to become negligible. So this plus one is negligible, plus k is negligible. Same thing here. This plus uh, k and this plus one here are negligible. So what we're left with is n sub i over n, which is the empirical probability that someone will be studying math, for example, times one minus n sub i over n, which is that one minus empirical probability someone's studying math all divided by n, which is the total number of students at the university. So the reason that this is a very nice thing for this variance to converge to with large sample sizes is because that's exactly the variance that you would expect for a sample of size n when you're asking what's the probability that somebody would be studying math. 
it's just the probability they're studying that subject times 1 minus the probability they're studying that subject divided by the number of people in your sample. And you might see this formula more familiar to if we stick a square root here across the entire uh, equations here. And of course the square root of the variance of a sample is the standard error of that sample. And this is the standard error formula we all know and love from our introductory statistics courses. So I think that's all I really had to say. The main points I wanted to get across, uh, the main main point is that the Dirichlet distribution is not really anything new. It's just an extension of the beta distribution. And if you understand the Dirichlet distribution, and if you just assume there's two classes, the probability density function will actually just collapse back down to the probability density function for the beta distribution. The other thing I wanted to get across was that the role of the Dirichlet distribution in data science is pretty much the same as the role of the beta distribution in data science, especially in Bayesian statistics where you have very small or no sample size and you're trying to come up with some kind of distribution for what an array of probabilities might be, where these probabilities represent the probability that the samples that you have fall into one of k classes. And I guess the last thing I want to note is just that it has really, really nice convergence properties just like we saw with the beta distribution. So thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I'll see all of you wonderful folks next time.